rejoice, all the earth rejoice. He wraps himself in light, and darkness tries to hide, and tremble at his voice, trembles at his voice. We're going to jump right into the message today, and what we want to do today is kind of um, review and talk about where we've been so far in the Christmas season. We don't want to just, and that's what the video was kind of about, um, we don't want to just immediately, and I know some of you rascals do it, you're the same people that had your Christmas trees decorated at Halloween, you know, uh, you're, you're the same ones like the very next day after Christmas, you, you've taken it down, I know people do that. But we kind of want to let it linger a little bit, all right? We were tempted yesterday at my house to get rid of, to do it, to take it all down. And uh, because, as you can imagine, with four boys, our place is a disaster. It is a mess. And there's still another week of school out. And so we were tempted last, yesterday, to... Uh, remove all the Christmas decorations and get them put up. And at, at one point, my, my wife, Jennifer, she said, I just, I, just, I just can't do it yet. I just can't do it yet. So if you haven't, let it linger a little bit longer, okay, because we're going to talk about Christmas stuff today. It can, um, it can wait just a little bit longer. Um, up to this point, we've been preparing for the arrival of Jesus Messiah, and we've been lighting the candles uh, which remind us of what he brings, hope, joy, peace, and love. You remember each week we light one of the candles reminding us that. And without him, we are hopeless, we are desperate, we are restless, and we are unlovable. This is the things that Jesus brings to our lives and he brings with us at his birth. 
And so we looked at three of the four gospel accounts throughout the Christmas season during this message series. Um, the gospel of Mark does not include a birth account, but we looked at three gospels uh, that break God's silence of 400 years as we transition from Old Testament to New Testament. Matthew is the first, and it, it, it connects the Old Testament to New, Test, New Testament with a, a paternal genealogy fit for a king. Also, he includes Joseph and the wise men. And then we looked at Luke, and Luke connects Old Testament to New Testament with John the Baptist, one of the last of uh, the Old Testament-type prophets, as well as uh, Luke included Mary and shepherds. And then we looked at the Gospel of John, connecting the Old Testament and the New Testament by explaining Jesus as eternal. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And then John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was God. The Word was with God. We also know that in the Old Testament, there are many, 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 many prophecies about Jesus Messiah, the Messiah, that Jesus' birth fulfilled, his incarnation here on earth fulfilled. He was the, the Messiah that was prophesied about over and over and over throughout the Old Testament. He was waited on. He was prepared for. He first came to save the world uh, from their sins. That's why he gave his life to save us from our sins. And we know that he will come again to save the world from external oppression. The question we need to ask ourselves this morning moving forward into uh, a new year is this. Knowing what we know, believing what we believe, what do we do with Jesus? What do we do with what we've learned about Jesus so far through his birth, his incarnation to us. And this is one of the most important questions, if not the most important question that we must ask ourselves. What do I, what do we do with Jesus? What do we do with what we know? What do we do with what we believe? So now, uh, as we move into 2024, we find ourselves in the second advent, right? First Advent, preparing, waiting for Jesus' incarnation. Second Advent, we're again waiting, preparing for the return of Christ. This time not as a baby, but as a warrior. To help us answer this question, what do we do with Jesus now as we wait in this second Advent? I think I want to go back and look at four of the characters that we've already talked about. Uh, that the four main characters in the birth narratives in the Gospels. Have you ever had something really pumped up to you? Like, for example, a restaurant. Uh, someone or maybe the internet or social media tells you that you have to go and eat at this restaurant. It's the best food, the best service, the best atmosphere there is. And so then you go to this restaurant, and unfortunately, it totally does not live up to the hype, right? You get there, and, and it's just a disappointment. Maybe not that it's necessarily bad, but it just didn't live up to the hype that was there. It's, it, maybe it's not even any better than Applebee's to you. We've been there. We've all been there. It's not necessarily a restaurant, but it could be a lot of different things. It could be a movie. It could be a television show, a book, a vacation. It could be a lot of things that didn't live up to the hype that people or the internets or social media had told us that it was so awesome. And so you leave disappointed. And you may, as you leave disappointed, you may or may not, and it's usually not, voice your disappointment. If it's really bad, then you would probably voice your disappointment. But usually, if it just didn't live up to the hype, we would just remain quiet. But however, if this restaurant or whatever it is does live up to the hype, 
you become its number one supporter, right? You become its number one fan. And they say that word of mouth is the best form of advertising and marketing for a reason because we talk about what we like and we love and we recommend it to our friends and family. And unfortunately, if it's really bad, we talk about that too. So you become its number one supporter, its number one fan, and you'll return again and again and again, and you'll tell people all about it, and you'll want to take them with you. The characters we find at the birth of Jesus were all invited by an angel or angels. They were invited to be a part of the birth of the Messiah, something that has been talked about and, and hyped, for lack of a better term, uh, for centuries, prophesied about and talked about. And now it's time, and here they are, they are invited to be a part of the story. None of the characters that we've looked at this Christmas left thinking or acting or talking like what had occurred was any kind of disappointment at all. And according to their reactions, it lived up and exceeded expectations, the prophecies and everything that they had learned. This didn't just live up to the hype, it far exceeded it. And we're going to see that that's the case by looking at some of the last bit of scripture for four of the main characters in Jesus' birth. And I want to start with Joseph. As we ask the question, what do we do with Jesus? What did Joseph do with Jesus? I, I remind you that we don't know a lot about Joseph, right? Um, Jesus' adoptive father. We, we know that he was righteous. We talked about that. We know that he was obedient. Um, he could have do, uh, divorced Mary publicly, but he didn't. But I will tell you this. Things didn't get easier for Joseph after um, he became Jesus' earthly father. They got much harder. We know that the wise men, they, they uh, visited them in a home when Jesus is two to three years old. Uh, and because the wise men, they had went to Herod, they thought they were doing the right thing, looking for the newborn king. Um, this is what it says in verse 16. I'll read it to, 16, I'll read it to you. Uh, Herod was furious when he realized that the wise men had outwitted him, and he sent soldiers to kill all the boys in and around Bethlehem who were two years old and under based on the wise men's reports of the star's first appearance. So things don't get easier for Joseph and his family after the birth of Jesus, even when he's a toddler. We learn that they had to escape. They had to escape to Egypt to escape the death of Jesus. And they ended up living in Egypt until Herod dies. And, and they return to find out that Herod's son is now the ruler. So Joseph is um, righteous and obedient, but we learned something else about Joseph. Joseph is protector. Just this morning, I was talking to another dad, and that's the first thing he said about being a dad, is our job is protector. And I think all you other dads would agree with me. Our number one job uh, as bringing, kids to Je bringing our kids to Jesus, leading our families to Jesus, our, our second job is protector, right? We are to protect. And we see this in Joseph, righteous, obedient, and then protector. We know that at any time throughout this relationship, because of the circumstances, Joseph could have called it quits. There are a lot of men in our society that are calling it quits on their families. And Joseph could have. But Joseph stuck it out, and he was protector of his family. Righteous, obedient, protector. Then we see the wise men. 
What did Joseph do with Jesus? He, he was his dad. He was his father. He was his protector. And when Jesus shows up in the scene uh, at age 30, starts his ministry, we see that we don't see Joseph anymore, but we see that he did what he did with Jesus. He protected him. Wise men, what did the wise men do with Jesus? I'm going to read Matthew to you. We've, we've read this scripture before already. Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the reign of King Herod. About that time, some wise men from Easter lands, eastern lands arrived in Jerusalem asking, Where is the newborn king of the Jews? We saw his star as it rose, and we have come to worship him. King Herod was deeply disturbed when he heard this, as was everyone in Jerusalem. He called a meeting of the leading priests and teachers of religious law and asked, Where is this Messiah supposed to be born? In Bethlehem, Judea, they said, for this is what the prophet wrote. And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not least among the ruling cities of Judah, for a ruler will come from you who will be the shepherd for my people Israel. Then Herod called for a private meeting with the wise men, and he learned from them the time when the star first appeared. Then he told them, Go to Bethlehem and search carefully for the child, and when you find him, come back and tell me so that I can go and worship him too. After this interview, the wise men went, to their, went their way, and the star they had seen in the east guided them to Bethlehem. It went ahead of them and stopped over the place where the child was, and when they saw the star, they were filled with joy. They entered the house and saw the child with his mother, Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasure chests and gave him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Verse 12, when it was time to leave, they returned to their own country by another route. For God had warned them in a dream not to return to Herod. Uh, I don't think this would have been the wise men's first rodeo. Uh, this, of course, different, but they would have been welcome guests to many royal births and, and coronations. They would have attended a lot of high-class functions with insiders. They, they knew to bring gifts, and they, they knew the perfect valuable gifts to bring, and they knew who to talk to first and, and where to go, and in this case, Herod, to get approval for their visit. They came from the east, and, and I've heard it speculated that they were descendants of Jews that were dispersed with Daniel. They knew Jewish prophecy, but when they left, if you read it in verse 12, when it was time to leave, they returned to their own country by another route, for God had warned them in a dream not to return to Herod. When they left, they didn't just take a different physical route, uh, avoiding Herod, but they, they returned having experienced something that was life-changing. <laughs> It has been said that they were the first missionaries for Jesus Christ in the East where they traveled from. And you imagine there were, there were still Jews that were dispersed there and, and generations of Jews that were uh, still there. And they received this news from the wise men that it is time the Messiah has come. And so these insiders, right, these uh, high-class insiders return as missionaries to outsiders. Next, I want to read Luke 2, 8 through 20, and this is about Mary and the shepherds. Joseph, what did he do with Jesus? He fathered him, protected him. Wise men, what, what did they do with Jesus? They, they followed him. They shared him with others. And now let's talk about Mary and shepherds. That night there were shepherds staying in their fields nearby, guarding their flocks of sheep. Suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared among them, and the radiance of the Lord's glory surrounded them. They were terrified. But the angel reassured them, don't be afraid, he said. I bring you good news that will bring great joy to all people. The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord, has been born today in Bethlehem, the city of David. And you will recognize him by this sign. You will find a baby wrapped snugly in strips of cloth lying in a manger. And suddenly the angel was joined by a vast host of others, the armies of heaven, praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest heaven and peace on earth to those whom God is pleased. 
When the angels had returned to heaven, the shepherds said to each other, let's go to Bethlehem. Let's see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. And so they hurried to the village and found Mary and Joseph, and there was the baby lying in the manger. Verse 17, after seeing him, the shepherds told everyone what had happened and what the angel had said to them about this child. All who heard the shepherd's story were astonished, but Mary kept all these things in her heart and thought about them often. The shepherds went back to their flocks, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen. It was just as the angel had told them. Let's talk about Mary. What did Mother Mary do with Jesus? It says that Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. I hope it's okay, but I, I just want to go back a couple weeks to repeat something from a couple weeks in a message we did uh, where we talked about Mary. Mary saw God incarnate his entire life here on earth. From birth in a barn with a feeding trough as a crib to, to a criminal's cross, to an empty tomb, Mary saw it all, the only person on earth to witness the entirety of his physical and carnage existence. Also, the things that nobody knows about, things that aren't found in the Bible, things that aren't found in extra biblical accounts of Jesus' life, Mother Mary saw. Mother Mary would have fed him and, and burped him and changed him and rocked him to sleep and consoled him. All the things that mothers do for their children, their newborn uh, babies. She would have also held him when they took him off the cross. She would have wiped the blood from his, his body. She would have clothed him. Mother Mary was there from barn to cross. She was there for the, the miraculous. In fact, she poked and, I don't say poked and prodded, that's bad, uh, influenced him to do his first miracle. And he did. As I told you a couple Sunday go, a Sunday ago when we said this, I, I believed Mary to be the greatest evidence scripturally that Jesus was indeed the Messiah. She saw everything as a mother. She saw everything. And here it says she treasured and pondered all that she experienced and all that she held in her arms. But she also followed her son. She was one of his followers throughout his ministry and his life and his work. She followed him as the Messiah too, you see. Yeah, Jesus was Mary's son, but also Jesus was Mary's Messiah. She believed in what she had received in her arms as a baby. And what she had received proved what she believed, that he was indeed the Messiah, her son. She saw it all. From birth to death, his human existence. And she was his number one supporter. She, she followed him. She believed in who he said he was. The shepherds, I told y'all that these are my favorite part of the characters of the story. So Joseph, what did he do with Jesus? He was a father, a protector. The wise men, they went back differently. They took Jesus with them. Mary, she treasured and pondered in her heart, and she followed her son as Messiah. And now the shepherds, what did the shepherds do with Jesus? After seeing him, we'll go back to the scripture we just read. After seeing him, the shepherds told everyone what had happened and what the angel had said to them about this child. All who heard the shepherds' story were astonished. The shepherds went back to their flocks, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen. It was just as the angels had told them. So what did they do? They told everyone. They were not selective in who they told. Their demographic was everyone. These outsiders, they even told insiders about Jesus. 
Everyone includes the same people that looked at them as, I put it bluntly, uh, looked at them as trash. These same people that looked at them as trash received um, the, the message that they got, that Messiah was born, Jesus is born, Savior is born. What's miraculous, though, is that these insiders, these people that looked at the shepherds as, again, trash, they were astonished. It says it right there in Scripture. They were astonished at what they had heard from the shepherds. So they went back. The shepherds went back. They went back, but they went back shouting from the rooftops what had occurred and what was to come. And they went back to their sheep in the field, right? Like they went back to being dirty, smelly, foul mouthed outsiders. They went back to the sheep in the field being shepherds. But they went back, dirty, smelly, foul mouthed outsiders that had been with Jesus, that had seen Jesus. And now they were filled with hope. They returned to life as examples of a God that was for insiders, right, and outsiders. A God that is for the greatest and a God that is for the least. So there's more characters in the story. I get that. There's, you know, Elizabeth and Zechariah and the angels and the star and possibly an innkeeper, maybe not, um, there's more characters in the story of Jesus' birth and incarnation here on earth. But as we look at the four main characters, and we ask the question, what do we now do with what we know and what we believe? What do we do with Jesus? And we see that Joseph was righteous and obedient and a protector. He was a father, and, and the wise men, they went back. They went back differently, though. And Mary, she treasured and pondered in her heart like a mother would, but she was also a follower of this Messiah. And the shepherds, they went back shouting, went back to their sheep, went back to doing their thing, but they went back differently as well. They went back shouting about what they had seen. So now we can really ask the question to ourselves. As we move out of this season of Christmas and into a new year, right? And, and we move out of this season um, of being at home a lot with our kids uh, and them driving us crazy. And, and it's just me? No? And we move out of this season uh, celebration and, and presents and gifts and all the things that we said, hey, that's a, those are good, but let's focus on Jesus, right? As we move out of this, this season and we get back to, dare I say it, normal, right? Because next Sunday when you come in this place, there's not going to be no gold flare when you come in the doors. The Christmas trees are going to be down. Sad. Your, your houses are going to be back to blank canvases, right? So dare I say, as we go back, just like everybody else in the story, as we go back to normal, what do we do with what we now know and believe? What do we do with Jesus? Most important question that we can ask ourselves, what do we do with this Messiah, this Savior, Knowing what we know. Now listen, I'm not saying you have to go into full-time ministry now that you know and you believe. I'm not saying you quit your jobs and you go to seminary and, uh, or, or you quit your job and you travel to the other side of the world and become a missionary. That, that's not what I'm saying. Now if God is calling you to that, all right, it's a different story. God is calling you to that. What I'm saying is, what do we do with Jesus when we go back to normal after all of this? When we go back to life as normal? Well, here's what I pray. 
for you and for me. I pray you go back to your schools, to your places of work, refreshed. I pray that you go back having been um, with the Father and have celebrated Jesus, right? Like, you shouldn't go back to work like that was a drag, right? No, you should come back to work and people say, wow, you had a great time off or a celebration. Yeah, absolutely. I pray you go back to whatever it is that you do day to day, having been changed, especially this year, by Jesus and his birth, his incarnation. That normal wouldn't be normal. That whoever we see, whatever we do, whoever we speak to, we would be like shepherds and wise men and Joseph and Mary. We take Jesus with us. We shout it from the rooftops. We're going to pray, and as we do, I just want you to keep asking this question to yourself. Knowing what I know, believing what I believe, having experienced what I've experienced this Christmas, what do we do with Jesus? What do I do with Jesus? Will you bow your heads and close your eyes with me? Father God, we have heard the story again this Christmas season, the true story of you sending your son to be born here to us and for us. We've maybe learned some new things about his birth here. Maybe we've learned some new things about the characters in this story, the real people involved in the birth narrative, the incarnation of your son Jesus. God, we've all celebrated in different ways with family and friends. But now, Father God, as we move into a new year and we move out of the Christmas season of of celebrating your son's birth and we actually look towards the cross from the beginning of his life here to the end of his life here, God, I pray that when we go back to work, to school, to our community activities, that we do so in a way that is not going back to the normal, Lord. Father, that we take your son Jesus with us Father, that we shout his name to those who are in desperate need of salvation. Father God, I pray this morning that if there's someone here who has not received Jesus as their Savior, I pray that this morning they would receive Jesus as Lord of their life. God, we're all going to stand and sing in just a moment. And as we do, Lord, I pray that your spirit would move in each of us. If there's sins that need to be forgiven, may we 
express that to you, God. May we cry out for forgiveness. May we repent. God, if there's someone that we need to forgive, Lord, I pray that we would do so. If there's changes that we need to make in our lives, God, I pray that we do that. That your spirit would move as we stand and sing. So that, Father, this new year, this going back is different. And you receive all the praise, the glory, and honor that you deserve as our mighty God, as a God that loves us, your children. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen.